Welcome, aloha. Thanks for joining us, Think Tech Hawaii, uh, rule of law in the new abnormal. And today, there are risks and challenges to equality rights under the law. We have with us Professor Emerita Cornelia Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law and leading scholar on race, racism and the law has fantastic compilation at her website, racism.org. And David Larson, professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in the Twin Cities in St. Paul, and immediate past chair of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution. So we have two learned faculty here able to talk to us about what's changing and what's at risk in driving toward more equality under the law. Professor Randall, you want to start us off? Well, it's this, uh, I, I think one of, I think Derek Bell, if you're aware, he's uh, dean, uh, one of, dean of uh, for Oregon Law School and one of the leading scholars on racism. In fact, I taught from his book. Uh, and uh, he used to say that racism and inequality is a permanent feature of American society. And that what we can do under the law is an occasionally uh, make things a little better uh, by things that we do. But the whole nature of how our society functions, the two-party system, the back and forth, the money in it, the ability to gerrymander around race, uh, the ability, I was just reading a, an amazing law review article that I posted on my website. And I, to me, it talked about one of the things, a small thing that could be changed is getting rid of prison gerrymandering. What is prison gerrymandering? Prison gerrymandering is when the, based on the census rule, this is not the law, this is a, this is a regulatory rule. When the census counts prisoners, they count them for the community the prison is in without regard to what community they came from. So what that does is, because census is the basis for giving communities money and power, prisons give rural, small rural counties more money, more power than their census would be entitled to. And, the, and they take that away from the communities the people come from. Because when people get paroled, are serve their sentence, they don't stay in the little rural community. They go back to the community or some similar community. So one of the things that could be done is to change that, to say, look, uh, unless a prisoner, for the purpose of the census, you will use the uh, place where the, person was arrested, or better still, ask the person who is a prisoner what community they want to be counted for, and then count them for that community. Uh, that would uh, impact significantly Black and Brown communities, because Black and Brown people are disproportionately represented in prisons. And so all of those people who are being counted for rural communities would start being counted for communities where black and brown people live. And that would pro provide more money 
more power. So that, that to me is a change in the law that would pr provide more equity uh, than current exists. Hey, David, what are some areas of concern for you that the law is moving in a questionable one, direction? One thing I'm concerned about is that, um, and we talked about this in, a, in some previous sessions about the politicization of the judiciary. And, you know, I think that I think benches have always been human and they have their own inclinations and prejudices and leanings. And they probably look for results that conform with those inclinations, but at least they would do it in a principled kind of way. They couldn't find at least a principle to rest upon then they say, okay, I've got to give it up. I can't push this any further, even though I want this result, I've got to let it go. I don't think we're there anymore. I think we're at a place now where if this is the result I want, I don't care whether it's principled or not, or whether or not I can justify it in terms of precedent. I just want the result. And I am in a position where I can dictate that. So I'm going to do that. And uh, that's, to me is extremely disturbing. Um, yeah, we've seen it in a lot of different areas, but um, I teach uh, labor and employment law. And so I get into questions about final binding mandatory arbitration employment agreements. And if you look at the history of those agreements, you know, the Supreme Court has swung in the direction that pretty much in every circumstance, those agreements are gonna be enforceable. Agreements where people say, I, I will only take my grievances to arbitration, I waive my rights to go to court for any statutory claim, all my discrimination claims, doesn't matter, I'm just going to go to arbitration. Courts have now consistently said that um, those are enforceable agreements. And that's because of the preemptive power of this federal statute, the Federal Arbitration Act. Well, that's pretty contrary to what the same justices do frequently um, when they turn to this doctrine of federalism. And they say that, well, the federal government can't regulate guns, and they can't regulate abortion, and they, they can't do these things. And uh, that should be for the states. The states should be able to regulate those things. So, so you've got this situation now when we're talking about arbitration and affects millions of people have these clauses in their contracts where we're going to say that states who have been trying now for several decades to protect their citizens from what they believe are adhesive, overreaching arbitration agreements by putting limitations on those, the court has consistently struck them down, saying that, well, the Federal Arbitration Act is a national statute and that should control and we should be uniform. Um, but in other areas, when the federal government has tried to regulate, um, they've stepped forward pretty consistently and said that these are things that states should determine. And um, we are invoking these principles of federalism and uh, respect for states' rights. So right now, I think we've got a court that's very result-oriented, that they're gonna, they're gonna, declare, they're gonna declare decisions um, that reach the result they desire in ways that are not particularly defensible and not principled. But David, my I guess my only thing is I have never felt the Supreme Court was principled. Well, you know, it, ever. It, it, yeah, well, I think it's a question yeah, of degree. You know, and 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 the whole concept of stare decisis was only used when it supported an outcome they wanted. And when it didn't, they ignored it. I, uh, I agree. That's why I that's why I was saying that I think benches and judges have always had those inclinations. But I, at least, and I may be wrong, but my sense was at least at some point, there was a, there was a respect that I've got to make the sound principled, if nothing else, I've got to get something to rest it on other than the result. And I think right now, I'm feeling that we've sort of abandoned that. And now it's just, you should embrace this because this is a result that all of us should want. This is a good result. So it doesn't matter how we got here. It's just, this is the right result. And that's what our obligation and responsibility is to do, to do the, to just 
achieve what we think is the right, right result, and you should think that too. But don't I guess I I I agree that that I I guess I'm wondering. Let me say it. I'm wondering if the problem is for many areas that are not related to race the it appears principle and so for it to not for 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 them to because i my view in reading race cases for the last 40 years is they get what they wanted and they ignored you know principles to get the result that they wanted and the result that they often wanted was to be colorblind and so they would that print they would promote that principle even when the principle uh didn't was not logical was not something that would be defensible uh and so i guess i wonder i guess i wonder if the prompt is this the courts have been able to get away with appearing principle because they use these principles that people uh, agreed with, sorry, decisis, all of these things. But because many people weren't reading race-based cases, they weren't seeing that the court wasn't using the same logic or our our principal thing when when they wanted to deal with race and racism and especially in terms of discrimination against black and brown and uh, native people and Asian people. So uh, I don't know. I, I I agree that this court has a particular outcome at once, but then so did Brown versus Board of Education. And so did Dred Scott. And, you know, you just, they had a particular outcome and they twisted themselves to get there. Well, the, you know, I'm not, never going to pretend that judges and courts don't try and conform the result to their personal inclinations. Um, that's always happened. I just have the sense that and maybe we are uncomfortable with the principles that they were relying upon. But it seems now that they're not even attempting to cover, that now it's just like, we know what's best, and we think you're probably going to agree with us, so we're going to decide this, this way. Maybe in the long term, in the, in a, I don't know, I don't want to say long term, maybe that might be better for us to mobilize because one of the things uh one of the things that uh i feel like is like okay in down south when you confront racism the racism can be very overt and in your face but you know it happens and no one disagrees with it's happening you go up north and people want to smile and be nice and say nice things and then stab you in the back and then when you complain about it it would be well what do you i'm nice i'm i'm not calling you names i'm not a racist maybe the court deciding because if they're making decisions over the last 50 years which they have been doing They've been eating away at abortion. They've been eating away at the whole uh, arbitration thing. They've been doing that. And by clothing it in some kind of false logic, people, the public has sit back and say, oh, well, you know, I may not agree with them, but at least I can see their logic. Maybe this could be a good thing that people will be so upset over the lack of logic, the lack of uh, hiding what they're doing, that there may be, I don't know, there may be uh, an uprising. Yeah, well, you know, in that, getting back to the arbitration world, um, 
At one point, we'll call versus Swan, we go back into the middle of the 20th century, and the court said that I don't think public law should go to arbitration. There are, there are interests here that need to have the light of day shown upon them. We need to know what's happening. Um, this has to go to court. Those are fundamental rights. And uh, no, you can't compel people to waive their rights to go to court. I think at that point, they sounded kind of principled. Um, but then they started to favor the result, the pro-business result of enforcing arbitration agreements and taking them out of court and putting you know behind closed doors. So we don't know what's going to happen. We're not sure what damages are coming out. Um, and uh, so, so this trend has begun, began... 1980, you know, 1980s, really during the Reagan administration, it really took hold, where they started to really embrace the result and not do it in a principled way. I'm just thinking about this one particular area where, where you look at these decisions and you compare the language to what they did really relatively recently, and it's just contradictory. So this whole notion of states' rights as being thrown out the door and it's all about the preemptive effect of this big national statute. So I guess my concern is that to the degree that that's been going on for some decades now, and maybe always historically, it just seems to be getting worse. And, uh, you know, getting worse in the sense that, and, and maybe Professor Randall's right, that's a good thing. It's like, just be open about it. That, that I'm not even going to try to to reconcile this on any principle. I just want the result, and I'm I'm now being honest for the first time ever. Um, maybe that's a good thing. Um, but to the degree that certain people have a a lot of power, and power to affect the lives of millions of people, the fact that they're honest about their abuse of power doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> It doesn't. I can understand why you wouldn't feel better. I don't feel better about it either, but I feel more empowered. Mm -hmm. I feel more empowered when people are straight up and honest about what they're doing. And because I feel like I can deal with that. I can deal with the people who, and I can organize people against it because they're not clothing the language in some hidden language that makes it look like that they're doing the right thing. But no, I can understand. I can understand, you know, it, 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 it would be disconcerting to me if I had had, uh, if for the last, 50 years, the Supreme Court has supported racial integration, and then suddenly, and then they, they stop supporting it. But that's not what has been happening. And so it, it, I, my shock and awe over the Supreme Court happened a long time ago, but I understand. Except with affirmative action, of course, and voting rights both of which they have eroded at the expense of clearly people of color and minority group. They, they, the Supreme Court has eroded affirmative action and voting rights. And, but that is consistent with how they erode racial inequality. I mean, they're really, you know, for what we have focused on the voting rights because it, it is put forth as a, a mechanism to level the playing field if we all just get out and vote. And so there, the Democrats have an interest in promoting and looking at voting rights, but it's voting rights not the only thing uh, that, that's been eroded. Uh, uh, under Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, there is no language in that act that specifically define what discrimination, what racial discrimination is. By court 
opinion, it was decided that discrimination had to be purposeful. So that's the first limitation put on by the Supreme Court of the United States. We have to have intentional conduct. Okay, first limitation. So then the regulatory agent agency put forth regulations that would allow people to sue for disparate impact. And say, saying if you can prove a disparate impact, that's the same as proving purposeful, okay? And so that kind of opened the door back up for it. And then the Supreme Court said, maybe little less than 30 years ago, uh, you, can, you can't sue for disparate impact. Disparate impact is a regulatory uh, thing. And so the only people who can sue is the agency. If you feel like you have been discriminated based on disparate impact, all you can do is complain to the agency, slamming the door on most forms of racial discrimination. And, the, and this is the thing that bothers me. I mean, lots of things bother me, but here's the thing. That could have been fixed by legislation. No Congress had taken it upon themselves to try to fix that, the, the Supreme Court decision. And I guess I want to ask you, is that the same true with, uh, with the arbitration? Could some of these problems be fixed by legislation? Sure. Sure, they could. Um, you know, the, the, there could be a clause. There's, a, um, there's an act that's been introduced a number of times to put limitations on the ability to impose mandatory binding arbitration agreements. And the limitations have been in the employment area, in the civil rights area, um, and in the cons consumer area. And that's been kicking around now for about 15 years. And it gets introduced every year, and um, it just can't get through Congress. But that's an example where you could say, stop doing this. It's not going to be, these waivers are not going to be enforceable. Um, we can allow business to business transactions enter into these kinds of agreements if they're comfortable doing it. But we don't want these, these, in, these power imbalance situations to be subject to these adhesion, adhesion contracts. So yeah, they could, you, we could, um, but we haven't. Has any president put it on their agenda as a primary item? to deal with? No, not that I'm aware of. I don't know any president that's that's come forward and said, this is this is a this is at the top of my agenda. I don't know that anyone has. So 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 and this is the complaint I have about our system. All three are functioning to, to make sure that things don't operate for the average person, for the for to, for you and your area for me in my area, because uh, no matter, the Supreme Court, almost everything the Supreme Court does can be fixed by legislation. And yet- I will, I will add that this past year, we did get an amendment to the FAA that says for sexual harassment cases, um, we're not gonna enforce these. So we had that little incremental step Right, that's right. It's, that's, that's what it was. Um, so, but but I, mean, that's, but I mean, that's an example of of what could and should be done in a broader sense. And for that, for me, that's an example of uh, Congress doesn't want to fix it uh, because if they if they can recognize the need to fix it for a small area, you know, they could be inching away at this one small area at a time, you know, you can't arbitration for sexual harassment or just, you know, do that. But, but we have a very dysfunctional, legally, 
the system is dysfunctional because of the Supreme Court, because of the uh, the the Court of Appeals, which I think we have to, we don't pay enough attention to the Court of Appeals uh, because there's only so many cases that the Supreme Court can take up. And at the end of the day, most decisions are going to be governed by what uh, circuit courts decide on the on the on their appeal because they're going to take many more um so we we don't we don't have that we don't have a ju judiciary we don't have a legislate legislature i'm not saying that right and we don't have a president if the president isn't but you know one time someone said to me we, i was talking to someone about priority of eliminating racism and they was like oh yeah it's a priority for me i really think that we need to work on eliminating racism in legal education and stuff i say yeah you do i don't discount that it's number 10 on your list and you know you're only going to get the three things so far as i'm concerned it's not much of a priority a president who doesn't come out and say that this is a priority is saying this is not a priority for them to put their weight behind. And then the legislature, you know, Congress that doesn't come behind it. And then of course the courts, uh, I don't know. I don't know what. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think that's right. Um, getting back to the law school, my law school in this past year, decided to declare we're an anti-racist law school with the understanding that that doesn't mean much of anything unless we can actually start to spell out some concrete steps as what we're going to do to implement that declaration. So we actually are spending a lot of time thinking about what are some concrete demonstrable things we can do to demonstrate that we actually are an anti-racist law school. So I think, yeah, you do need that second step. It isn't enough to just say we're anti-racist, end of the story. Or we want fair arbitration uh, things. You've got to take those steps to do that. Right. So great insight. Unfortunately, we're out of time for today. But for the law school and for any other law schools, one of our panelists, Dean Danielle Conway of Dickinson Law at Penn State, they have one of the most sophisticated anti-racism programs four law schools in the country welcome getting in contact with her, getting the information on their program. <clears throat> but you're right, the role and responsibility that the framers intended to assign and impart to all three branches of government was a balancing of these competing interests and values that we know will always be part of our life. And that balance, balancing responsibility has been ignored and eroded and fallen away. So thanks for great insights and perspectives. Folks, rejoin us in a couple of weeks. We'll be back with more current issues and topics. And so glad, Professor Randall, that you have so far survived things well in Orlando, Florida, and hope that the rest of the state will recover as soon as may be possible. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Take care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.